Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're going to be talking to Louis Vaccaro. Um, he's written a book, Around the Corner, from shoeshine boy to college president. He's from Los Angeles, but he spends a lot of his time, half the time in um, our area, Old Forge, but he's down in our area um, in his wife's family. But you may know his name because he was president of the College of St. Rose from 1983 to 1996. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. I get, um, you know, your book, Around the Corner, From Shoeshine Boy to College President, you are from Los Angeles. Before we talk about the book, why don't you give us the short capsule biography of your long and storied life here, because you've been all over the place. But I this, know. And yes. then we, once we let people, we'll talk about the book. Well, I like to say that I was born at the height of the Great Depression, <laughs> 1930, which is a long time ago. So this will have to be a short version. And uh, I was born right down in, in Los Angeles one mile from the University of Southern California that I eventually would attend to get a couple of degrees, although at the time I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about college, and uh, grew up in a, an Italian immigrant family, a lot of kids, seven kids. I was the eldest boy, lived with my grandparents, my mother, my father, my aunt, and then later my, one of my uncles. Uh, my father's motto was, in Italian, chi non lavora non mangia. You don't work, you don't eat. And that was the mantra in our home, especially during the Great Depression. Mm. Attended uh, Catholic parochial school for seven years before we moved outside of Los Angeles to Tarzana, California, which was about 30, 40 miles away in the, in the farmland. And finished uh, my eighth grade there and then moved to Van Nuys, where I went to high school and then eventually started junior college for one year before I went into the Air Force during the Korean War. Okay, and then you started, you had an academic, academic career. Right, after I got out of the service in 1953, I had the GI Bill, so I went back to junior college, finished there, and then uh, transferred to the University of Southern California. And the reason I went there was that the woman who gave me a test through the VA said, boy, you're a natural for public relations. And I said, well, what, what, what should I do? She said, well, go to the best journalism school, which was the University of Southern California. So I used to commute three or four times a week from Van Nuys to Los Angeles, which is 50 miles round trip, mm -hmm. while all the time holding one or two jobs, because eventually, and after my first semester there, I got married and uh, kept working, following my father's dictum. And my father's other uh, advice to me was, uh, do something with your brain. Don't work with your hands or your back, because he was a truck driver and a plumber, and he knew how hard that was on your life. So I kept at it, went to school, uh, acquired a lot of degrees, and began moving from place to place okay. to take advantage of opportunities. Well, you, why don't we start then, you know, talk about the book. You spend a little bit of time in the beginning of the book talking about growing up in this large Italian extended family yeah. and all the jobs you've had. I, I think I lost count of the number of <laughs> jobs you had. But <laughs> and I didn't list them all. <laughs> um, well, how come you spent, well, how, what was it, tell us about the importance of this extended family and why you sort of included so much of this in your yeah. In your book here. Well, you know, a lot of people will, especially some of my students abroad, will say, gee, you're so well-educated. Uh, where did you learn everything? I said, well, I may have a lot of degrees. I said, but the important things that I learned in my life, I learned in the family, from my mother and my father and my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts. Uh, There's a lot of wisdom there. Mm -hmm. Even though my grandparents were illiterate, they couldn't even write their own name in Italian, let alone English. Uh, my father did go to vocational high school, and my mother finished eighth grade. But there was uh, a respect for teaching and for learning, and uh, 
I learned a lot just listening. Well, it sounds like you carried a lot of these lessons throughout your whole life. And although this is getting ahead of the story, near the end of the book, one of your former students mentions that when you're a college president, you had your father's plumbing license on the wall. Why yes. did you tell us about At that? At the College of St. Rose. <laughs> that student was a Chinese student by the name of Daniel Tan from Shanghai. And he was uh, a principal of a primary school, a middle school in China before he came to St. Rose to do some postgraduate work. And he wanted to visit me in my office one day. And he came in and he saw this. He saw a lot of things on the wall, yeah. but he sees my father's plumbing license. He said, what is that? I said, that's my father's plumbing license. He said, why do you have it there? He said, to remind me from where I came and that what kind, no, no matter what kind of work you do, it's always honorable. And he took a lesson away from that saying, because this was not true in China, that wherever you are in America, whatever station in life you're born into, you can always move on because of the opportunities. Oh, I think that was... Um is that the person? I think he said something about that. Is that in America, it doesn't seem like where you're from or who you are holds you back. Exactly. Obviously, only someone from another country. And well, and that, is, that. It was especially true for China. Yeah. If you weren't born into a, a favored family, uh, you weren't going to be able to do much. Well, I'm talking about that. In the, in the early part of your book, you do mention um, a little bit about because you were the son of immigrants, they were sort of, I don't know, they forced you or recommended you go to a vocational school, but you... Well, it was a public high school that had both uh, college prep yeah. courses and vocational courses. And the counselor made an assumption because I was born into an immigrant yeah. family that there's no way that I was going to go to college. So they pushed me into the vocational track, which in retrospect, I think was a benefit to me mm -hmm. because I did learn a lot of practical knowledge that I even use today and a new mode of thinking that you don't get in what we call oh, yeah. collegiate prep courses. But uh, I was able to graduate in the top 20, 25% of the class, which then made it possible for me to go to a junior college. And then there okay. I made up a lot of the academic courses that yeah. I needed to go to the University of So Southern if California. you hadn't been in the top part of the class, would you, um, would that have prevented you at the, in that time? Was this the late 40s or 50s? This was, early 50s? Uh, this was uh, around 1950, 1949, 1950. Would that have prevented you from going on the academic track? At that time, I don't think it would have prevented uh, me, but I do remember the woman in the admissions office of the college saying, where did you graduate? And I said, I don't know. And see, she calculated. Yeah. She says, well, you graduated in the top 20%. Okay. She said, there's no problem. But I don't think it would have been a problem. Okay. All right. And one more thing on your uh, childhood here, before we get into the, um, the bulk of your college presidencies, you do mention, um, because you lived in Los Angeles in 19, uh, must have been during the war, World War II, you actually witnessed Japanese Americans being taken to the internment camps. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's yes. It was very, I mean, it was a little short thing in here, but it's found it very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we lived, uh, we li I lived on Dana Street <clears throat> during the war, and uh, we had a, a tight-knit group of kids. We called ourselves the Dana Street Commandos. Our job was to help the armed services beat mm -hmm. our enemies, the Japanese and the Germans. Also included Italy, but we didn't consider them <laughs> the enemies. But uh, one day we were down on the corner next to uh, Johnny's malt shop, uh, uh, Mr. Parker's malt shop, and an army truck rolled up and four or five guys jumped out with uniforms and they start tacking up these notices on the uh, telephone poles warning that the Japanese aliens must register and be ready to move out within a matter of a week or so. And, I mean uh, Japanese Americans or Japanese? Yeah, they were Japanese oh, I Americans. Think they were Japanese aliens. Or? Well, they, some were aliens, oh, okay. some were Japanese Americans, some, oh, okay. what we call Nisai. Uh, and, uh, you know, we didn't, at that time I was like 10 or 11. Um, but anyway, within a few short weeks, then I was walking to my cousin's home a few blocks away, and we walked by one of the Japanese family's home, homes. And uh, there was the truck out there loading their belongings. When I say belongings, I mean suitcases, yeah. that's it, with the family, and they took them away. 
and uh, most of them ended up in either Northern California, Oregon, Washington, or Idaho. That was, a, I think, a tragic page in our history. But Roosevelt did what he thought he had to do, and uh, of course they didn't do it for the Germans, and they didn't yeah. do it for the Italians. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Uh, well, after your college career here, your, um, it sounds like you didn't last too long in the <laughs> corporate world. You wrote, you're right in here. You wrote. You wrote. You wrote. I'm sorry. You worked for Pacific Bell. Now this must have been the era of what the man in the gray flannel suit. So that didn't really last too long. Your corporate life. So then you started pursuing this education. How did that? Tell us. Well, maybe it was because I, you write in here. You've. You had a big interest in philosophy and theology, so I don't know if that really spurred you on to the educational world. I don't know. It's all tied together, <laughs> but when I uh, graduated from USC, 1957 or 58, I was offered a couple of jobs. I interviewed, and at that time we were married, and we were expecting our second child, uh, so I needed a job. And the uh, Bell Telephone, which was a subsidiary of AT&T, mm -hmm. had a management training program. So they offered me a job, uh, $400 a month, which was big money for me, because I wasn't making anywhere near that part time. Um, so uh, I took the job and was in, got into a three year management program. The end result was going to be I was going to be moved back to New York to the headquarters. But uh, I'll tell you, I, I didn't really uh, like the corporate life because anytime I would sit down with friends at lunch or, or coffee, all they would talk about is what they're going to do when they retire, what they're going to do on their vacation, and what they're going to do on the weekend. Nobody had any ideas. Right. You couldn't talk politics, economics, philosophy, anything. So I kept going to school at night. And in, in that experience, I uh, fell in love with philosophy and theology and met a lot of people and discovered that I really wanted to become a teacher. Right. So I left my job after three years and uh, started teaching in a private prep school. Okay, and then I guess you started on the string here of becoming the president of small Catholic colleges that were formerly all women, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's true. So once, um, you know, the interesting thing about your book, um, I don't know, it was that maybe it was, maybe networking was different back then. How, you got all these jobs, a lot of it had to do, it seemed, I don't want to say just by knowing people, but did everyone, a couple of your jobs said, well, so-and-so needs someone. Can you, do you want to go talk to him? And tell us about that, well, let me the year you, of getting a job in that. Let me that. tell you about the first one, because I thought it was very fortuitous, very providential. I was in a graduate uh, class at USC, and there was a, a sister, and she just happened to be a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph mm -hmm. of Carondelet, who run St. Rose. At that time, I didn't know anything about that particular religious order. And her name, I'll remember her name forever, her name is Sister Rose Amata. And she said, what are you going to do when you finish your master's here? I said, well, I don't know. She said, well, what, what would you like to do? I said, well, I think I'd really like to teach in a small college outside of California. I didn't like, even though I'm a native son of Los Angeles, I didn't like the culture in Los Angeles. So she said, well, I think I can help you. So she introduced me to the dean of another Catholic college in Hollywood, it was called Immaculate Heart mm -hmm. College. And through her good offices, she helped me put a resume together. We sent out letters. I think we sent out eight or nine letters, and I got back two or three positives. And one of them was from St. Mary's College of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. And they offered me a job over the phone. And I went there, took my family, and started my career teaching at St. Mary's College. Now, is this, when you met this nun, was this when you were still working for Pacific Bell, but going to school all the time, or? Uh, let's see, I think at that time, I think at that time I was working uh, on my master's at USC after I had done oh, okay. my master's at Cal State Northridge. Okay, now, so that was your first in, in these string of jobs Women's here. colleges. But, um, well, some of the themes that come up in, um, in the book, building a, building a small school, a lot of these schools you took over were, um, I don't want to say they were on the decline, but they had small enrollments. And started, instead of about talking about each one individually, tell us some of the similar things you did. How, how do you build 
a school, a, 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 as you say in the book, a first-rate Catholic university. Right. That was a question that Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame and I used to talk about a lot. I would always ask him, how do you build a first-rate Catholic university? And his answer, which I, is imprinted on my brain, said, Louis, he said, you build a first-rate Catholic university by building a first-rate university, mm -hmm. which means the essentials for building any kind of a university, whether it's Methodist, Jewish, Catholic, whatever, Protestant, public, is you've got to have the best faculty and the best and most promising students. So I took that to heart. And uh, when I was at uh, Notre Dame teaching at St. Mary's, I kept taking classes off campus from Michigan State. And a professor from Michigan State approached me one night after class, said, what are you gonna, when are you gonna get your PhD? I said, how can I? I said, at that time we, were, we had four kids. <laughs> And he, he said, and I was making a magnificent sum of $500 a month. He says, well, maybe we can help you. He says, come on up to East Lansing. So I drove up there, took a battery of tests, interviewed with a group of professors, and they offered me a W.K. Kellogg Fellowship, which made it possible to move the family again up to East Lansing and embark on the completion of my degree. Times were different then. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Well, one thing you mentioned in here, in your book, about all these places, all the schools you worked at, is um, one thing that helps build a school is the importance of um, having a sports um, program. Tell, tell us why that's important, well, especially for smaller schools. Maybe. Well, especially for the women's colleges where they were trying to attract men. I'll, I'll use the College of St. Rose as an example. When I got here in 83, they were co-educational mm -hmm. in name, but they weren't bringing in many men, maybe 15, 18, 20 percent were men. So we were brainstorming how to do I said, look, I've done this before. I did it at Siena Heights in Michigan. I said, you have to develop a sports program that will attract men. Were these schools, these other schools you're at, were they also trying to go from all women's to co-ed? Well, Siena Heights was. Yeah. Uh, Mary Crest in, in Iowa was. Uh, Siena Heights, St. Rose. and. Uh, Colby Sawyer up in New Hampshire okay. remained a women's college, but I began, okay. I converted it from a two-year women's okay. college to a four-year, okay. and then eventually a co-ed. Okay. And, and so the sports were a way, first of all, to make the, no, the name better known and appreciated and to attract more men and more women who wanted to go to a co-ed mm -hmm. school. So it worked. It worked at St. Rose, it worked at Siena, it worked at Mary Crest, and eventually it worked at Colby Sawyer. Uh, it was the fact that St. Rose had great programs, but there were a lot of young boys, young men, who wouldn't apply because mm -hmm. they didn't want to be known as going to a women's college. Yeah. So w we also changed, a lot of people were using CSR, CSR. I said, no, <clears throat> nobody knows what CSR is. I said, but if you say the College of St. Rose, that's a strong name. Let's use that, and that worked. Well, St. Rose actually is known not only for their sports now in Division II, but they are known as an excellent small school. In fact, I think there was a front page story in the New York Times last year all about St. Rose. Was that last year? They, they're getting a lot of good press, and, and as a matter of fact, when I went there, there were fewer than 2,500 students. When I left, there were like 4,600, but today, they're 5,100. Yeah. yeah. They have an excellent art program, music program, uh, science, pre-med, wonderful school. 5,100 students on a small footprint oh, yeah, of real yeah. estate. So now you're known, I guess you could say, for these building, building smaller schools up. Another thing that, probably the thing you're most known for that is a lot of, a lot of the book here, and in the book there's a lot, I'll just tell people watching, in the book there's a lot of um, quotes from, from um, Lou's former students and colleagues. You're, you're really known for bringing international students to every place you've worked. And why don't you tell us about, about that, that whole concept, I guess, because you've done it everywhere, you, and like I say, this is what you're really known for. Well, when I got my first job out of Michigan State at, at Marquette University, which is a Jesuit university in Milwaukee, I had my first encounter <clears throat> with international students, and I became imbued with the idea that that was the way for all American colleges to go 
to bring in more international students, professors, which would expose the American students and faculty to ideas that existed in other cultures. So when I left uh, Marquette and I went to Marycrest in Iowa, Davenport, Iowa, I, uh, well, then I, I went to the University of Portland in Oregon first, which is where it, my interest in international education intensified. But when I went to Marycrest, we were trying to uh, move out of a provincial type of mindset. Mm -hmm. And so I brought in a couple of students from China. Actually, they're from Taiwan. And uh, with that, it be we began to bring in students as well from, from India, from Africa, uh, from South America. And, and the more that our students and faculty encountered these other students from other cultures and other countries, the more they became convinced that this was the way to go. So I took that idea uh, from Mary Crest, I took it to Colby Sawyer up in New Hampshire, from there to Siena Heights, from Siena Heights mm -hmm. to St. Rose. And when I left St. Rose, we had more than 30 countries represented. Okay. Not huge numbers, but maybe 120, 130 students, but enough to make a difference in the classroom. Sent some faculty and students from St. Rose to China and uh, brought students from Turkey, from Mexico, from Peru, from all over. And it really made a difference within the environment. Well, you write in your book that having international students, I guess it applies to faculty also, it's that you write in your book that it um, raises the level of intellectual diversity. Um, how does how do international students and faculty, how, how, do they, how do they add to the intellectual life of a, of a university? Well, I, I will give you an example, it, and it happened at St. Rose. There was a professor who was teaching a course, I think, on political science or economics, and most of the students were Americans, most of them from the capital mm -hmm. region. And so you might say they were homegrown, provincial, not in a bad sense. But in that class were a couple of students from the Middle East. And the, 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 the faculty member's question was, who is the person you admire most? And of course, all the Americans were talking about, you know, President Kennedy and President Eisenhower and ba-ba, ba-ba, ba-ba. This one student, I don't know, I can't remember what country he was from, he gets up and he says, the, the, the person I admire the most is Ayatollah Khomeini. Everybody was <laughs> shocked. What? They didn't even know who that person was. And, and the professor said, well, well, tell us, why do you do that? And so, and that was the beginning. It was like a, a yeast as a leaven yeah. in, in that classroom uh, a debate. And that carried over into a lot of uh, subject areas. Okay. Now, how do you go about, I mean, how did you go about in all these places recruiting um, all these students? Well, my first experience abroad was in Greece and Brazil. But in Brazil, I ended up, uh, during a 10-year period, of spending my, a lot of my vacation period there lecturing and consulting down there. And while I was down there, I would meet potential students, and mm -hmm. I would convince them to come to the U.S. I'll give you one example. Just by meeting them, one-on-one, on one, I mean. Well, it's one-on-one, <laughs> on one, but also when I'm giving lectures in the, in the university, okay. they would approach me. But this one student, and my Portuguese at that time was not great. It was okay, but it was not great, so I needed a translator. And so a friend introduced me to a young man by the name of Marco Pinheiro, Marco was born in a very poor family, and he was at the university, what they call the Hural, the rural university, where he was studying forestry. His big goal in life was to get his degree and go to the Amazon. Marco, at the time, was a young man, you know, 20, 21, 22, and I got him a partial scholarship. That was at Siena Heights, not St. Rose, excuse me, Siena Heights. And, uh, as a consequence, he got his degree in business and finance, ended up with Citibank. They gave him, a, uh, they gave him an internship and they gave him a job. And in, from Citibank, he met a very wealthy Jewish gentleman who owned a big company by the name of Global Equity. 
The guy liked Marco, and he said, Marco, why don't you come to work for me? Marco says, well, I'm making good money now. I'm, you know, I'm making, I don't know what he was making, yeah. maybe 15000 a year, which was big money for him. The guy says, no, no, you come with me. He says, you'll make big money. So Marco eventually went to work for him, and eventually the, the, the final chapter in this is Marco eventually ended up buying that company uh -huh. from the owner. And today, Marco is a multimillionaire. In fact, I spoke with him last night. We're going, I'm taking him to China next month, and then I'm going back with him to, uh, to Brazil. Marco is a graduate of Siena Heights. He just made a commitment of $1 million to the university because they're building a new sports oh, stadium. That story um, sounds like some of the ones in the book. Um, a lot of your former students are amazingly successful. Yeah. Not your former, the former people you brought over. How did, um, when you go to these other countries, all over the world obviously, what is, do, do a lot of these students, is, is there a thirst for education in America or just for education in, in general? Mainly America because America has the, the best universities in the world. I would say of the top 25, mm -hmm. we are, we have maybe 15 or 16 of the best. Everybody knows Harvard, Princeton, mm -hmm. Yale. Uh, not many people know St. Rose or, or <laughs> Siena Heights, but more of them know about those schools today because of my work abroad. But they do know that an American degree is a passport to a, a better job when they go back home. So uh, they would approach me, and many of them, of course, didn't have much money. And so I'd have to uh, help get jobs for them on campus, give them partial scholarships. And most of those students, if not all of them, never forget that. Because in addition to doing that, my wife and I when I was at St. Rose, my wife and I would go to the airport, meet the students, bring them to our home. Many of them would live with us for two, three, four days a week or two weeks until they got situated. Uh, one guy lived with me for a year, and now he's a top executive with Reuters International, okay. Reuters Thompson in Boston. Uh, they have never forgotten that, and they are what I call my second family and why the Chinese students call me the Chinese Godfather. Right. Well, the, the book <laughs> is filled with stories of you personally helping people like that and helping them with their, their actual doing their work. And their, so how did, and this is hundreds of students, I have to say, in the book, if you, you read about it. Now, as a college president, how did you have time for this? Weren't you busy uh, administering, being an administrator? Well, you make time for what, what is important. Mm -hmm. And for me, this was important. Uh, I, I'm, I've always, I never took a job for the amount of money that I would earn. Never in all of my 30-some years in higher education, I've never negotiated for a salary. I just took what they offered mm -hmm. me. I did it because I was passionate about my work, and I am still passionate about helping international students, which is why I'm going back to China next month and why I'm going back to Brazil probably in November. Uh, that is the that is the one ingredient that is necessary to make an international education program on a campus okay. successful. You have to have someone who's passionate. So about you're it. still doing you're still doing obviously that that kind of work, and I think you also it's, it's mentioned in the book in a lot of these schools you you would go to all the all the home games of all the sports teams. <laughs> yeah, well, now, that, yeah, you do that to show that you're interested mm -hmm. in them, not interested in them because they're bringing okay. tuition money but you're interested in them as individuals, which is another reason why I also developed the, the practice of uh, cooking Italian dinners for students and faculty. Oh, that's all right. That's one thing I was going to mention in here, too. You're doing all yeah, this. I began that at Siena Heights <laughs> and carried it through to all the colleges, including the two interim assignments that I had. The students love that. And they responded by then their putting on international dinners for the faculty. All right. Well, this sounds like quite the academic career. I want to end with, um, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, but no. your last chapter here is a very short little coda, I guess you could say. It's called self-study. Well, I was wondering why, um, can you tell us about that and why you added that? It's, I found it very interesting. Well, most of the writing I did before this book was academic type mm -hmm. of writing. I did a lot of books and papers, research papers and articles. And I felt that because this was a memoir, an autobiography of sorts, I needed to 
add that on the end as sort of like a self-confessional uh, owning up. There are a lot of things I did in my life that were good, a lot of things I could have done better in, and a lot of things that I shouldn't have done, like I should not, I should have spent more time with my own kids instead of running off mm -hmm. to these other countries. And I needed to own up to that, and which is what I tried to do there. I, I have been blessed with two wonderful marriages and um, the women who were, who were, who was, who were <laughs> my wives and who is, who is my wife today, Linda Lasher, who is also a teacher, uh, were so helpful in uh, letting me advance my career. I don't like to think of it as a career. I like to think of it more as a vocation, mm -hmm. a calling. And uh, it's almost, uh, to paraphrase one of my professors at Michigan State, when I would approach a, a lectern to give a lecture, as he would say, I am approaching sacred ground. I am helping you understand the, the, the kernel of truth in what I am about mm -hmm. to say. And so it is a sacred calling. It is a vocational, a vocal calling. And uh, that to me has made my work all the more rewarding. That's, what, that's why I was called to teach and why I continue to try to do this today. And then you were, you were particularly um, thankful to your first wife there in that little section about your... She, she you know, was the one who bore the brunt of raising the, mm -hmm. the, the children. And uh, I owe her a debt of gratitude, and I owe my current wife, Linda, a great, great debt of gratitude because she has helped me through a lot of tough spots in coming to terms with a lot of the truth that I needed to confront. And Linda herself is a very, very talented teacher and a great ambassador for the United States. She's been with me on n numerous trips to China. There's a lot about her in there, a lot of pictures with Linda and I uh, enjoying our friends in China. And uh, got another call last night from a Chinese student. I probably will hear from, during the course of a year, 35 or 40 students who will call or send emails. And so you're, you're still in touch with many of these? Oh yes, okay. yeah, they don't let you forget. All right. Well, the last, that little last section I was talking about, very moving, the whole book, very interesting, um, Lose Life, you can read about. Around the corner, uh, where can people, I mean, this is a library book. If you, you can come in and check it out if you want. But if people want to buy one, tell us where they can get one. Locally, they could get it from the book house in the Stuyvesant Plaza. Okay. Or now it is in the campus store at the College of St. Rose campus. But if people want to call in, they can call in to the publisher at 1-877-BUY, B-U-Y, book, B-O-O-K. Okay. And they'll take your order over there. Infinis, Infinity Publishing. All right, yeah. well, thank you for coming by and tell us about the book. And good luck on your world travels, I guess you're <laughs> continuing. So it's Around the Corner from Shoeshine Boy to College President by Lou Vaccaro. And we'll see you next time on Meet the Author.